I'm Jack Lapsley, and this academic year I'm the chair of the Faculty Support and Development Committee. One of the tasks of this committee is to oversee the inaugural lectures of our faculty when they take up their work as full professors. This evening is both the last in the wonderful series of the Annie Kincaid Warfield Lectures this week that Professor Dirk Smith has been giving. And tonight's lecture is also his inaugural lecture as the Rimmer and Ruth DeVries Professor of Reformed Theology and Public Life. So, on behalf of the Faculty Support and Development Committee, I welcome you all to Professor Smith's inaugural lecture. The lectures are all being video recorded and will be available next week on the website. And please know that after the lecture this evening, there will be a reception right outside of these doors to which you are all most warmly welcome. And now I invite President Barnes to introduce Professor Smith. As Professor Lapsley indicated, this is a very uh, special occasion for our seminary as we not only conclude the Annie Kincaid Warfield Lecture Series, but also celebrate Dirk E. Smith's inaugural lecture as the Rimmer and Ruth DeVries Professor of Reformed Theology and Public Life. Before joining the Princeton Seminary faculty last fall, Dr. Schmidt served as Distinguished Professor of Systematic Theology at Stellenbosch University in South Africa. Professor Schmidt also previously served on the faculty at the University of the Western Cape and as a pastor. Over the past three decades, Professor Schmidt has emerged as one of South Africa's most significant theologians. He has written extensively on the legacy of the Reformed tradition and its relevance to contemporary theological, social, and political questions. He has been a particularly prominent and influential voice in the church's repudiation of apartheid. He was one of the primary authors of the Belhar Confession, which boldly declared the sinfulness of apartheid and called for justice, reconciliation, and unity amongst all people. This confession, which was originally written in 1982 and adopted by the Dutch Reformed Mission Church in 1986, was recently adopted as part of the Presbyterian Church USA's Book of Confessions as well. In the years since the drafting of the Belhar Confession, Dr. Schmidt has continued to advocate in South Africa and around the world for a more just society. His work is characterized by a deep conviction about the distinctive contribution of the Reformed tradition to a way of being the church and to the church's public life. Several years ago, he gave a lecture entitled, Could Being Reformed Have Made a Difference? And he asked the provocative question, could it have made a difference during the apartheid years if practical theology and ethics in South Africa would have been more sensitive to the real needs of the real people like Calvin? He reminded his audience that Calvin's theology was an eminently practical theology concerned with real people, the real church, and with the real world. He said for Calvin's theology was not speculative, merely theoretical, merely intellectual. Doing theology for Calvin was all about practice, about life, piety, obedience, discipleship, and renewal. In Dr. Schmidt's own teaching and research, we see this commitment to truth, reconciliation, and Christian unity, also not in a merely theoretical way, but for the real issues facing real people in the real world. We're grateful for the ministry that he now brings to our students at Princeton Theological Seminary. His lecture this evening is entitled, Making the Good Confession Before Pontius Pilate. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Dirk Smith, the Rimmer and Ruth DeVries Professor of Reformed Theology and Public Life. Uh, may I once again express my sincere thanks to uh, President Barnes and to 
Professor Bruce McCormack for the invitation to uh, the uh, Warfield Lectures this year and to the whole seminary community and the students, uh, all guests and friends for the uh, wonderful uh, atmosphere, friendly atmosphere and for your faithful attendance during this week. Uh, since this is also my inaugural lecture, also my thanks to Professor Lapsley for organizing this and to Princeton Theological Seminary for the privilege to be appointed um, in this chair and for the opportunity to teach here with wonderful colleagues and with wonderful students. Ria and myself are very grateful for the warm welcome and the friendship that we still receive from the whole uh, seminary community. Almost 25 years ago, John de Grouchy was the first South African to give the Warfield Lectures, published as Liberating Reformed Theology. His final lecture was called Theology Framed by Politics. His argument was that the reform tradition is from beginning to end about politics. His own lectures were also structured in that way, framed by politics. The first chapter of his book placed reformed theology in the political struggle in South Africa, and the final chapter returned to the political responsibility of the church. He argued that this was also true of Calvin. Even the institutes was framed by politics, from the letter to the king of France to the warning to political tyrants. De Grouchy was deeply aware of the ambiguity of these relations, and therefore his ambiguous title, Liberating Reformed Theology. For him, the tradition both provides liberating potential and stands in need of liberation itself. Receiving the invitation, my first intuition was to continue his story on our South African experiences of reformed theology framed by politics. The letter invites one to develop any reformed doctrine. My instinct was to speak about the doctrine of election, often regarded as cardinal tenet of reformed faith. It has been called the sum of the gospel. It has been called the heart of the church. And although several Princeton theologians play leading roles in redefining the doctrine of election in our time, no one seems to have dealt with election in the Warfield lectures. At the same time, the reform doctrine of election has been deeply ambiguous, perhaps more so than any other doctrine. White South African reformed people in particular became infamous for views on election and covenant being chosen, being called with a special purpose. The black reformed scholar and public intellectual Russell Botman remarked that the picture of Calvinism held by the general public is characterized above all by one specific doctrine, namely the doctrine of election and its relation to a certain way of living. For him, unjustified perceptions of the doctrine of election were often distortions with horrifying social implications as a result of their relation with certain ways of living. In South Africa became a socio-political laboratory for such a distorted view, he said. I therefore decided to reflect on the ways in which we speak about election and how this election speak is related to certain ways of living. This year is, after all, also the 400th commemoration of the Synod of Dordrecht. The focus would not be on the doctrine itself and how it should be formulated and understood, but on ways in which election language is used 
and perceived, experienced, and suffered. In Botman's words, my focus would be on the relation uh, of the doctrine to a certain way of living. In his The Hermeneutics of Doctrine, the prolific British scholar Anthony uh, Thistleton argued that doctrine is not about systems of a contextual and a historical propositions. Instead, doctrine forms part of human responses to questions arising from real life, he said. They belong to life contexts as self-involving speech acts, dispositional accounts of belief, convictions that imply and involve commitments, he said. They are embedded in life forms, function like rules of games, form the grammar of communal stories and commemorations and practices. Doctrines serve those who speak their language in the project of wise living, Fizzleton said. And therefore, doctrines call for formation, quoting Gardamer, for training, quoting Wittgenstein. Doctrines call for education and transformation, he argued. Developing doctrine, as one is invited in this letter, developing doctrine therefore involves the vocabulary of character formation, of judgment and training and habit and human agency. We cannot think decently and we cannot speak doctrine if we do not want to hurt ourselves, he said, again quoting Wittgenstein. If we are not willing to pay the price of such thinking and speaking, doctrine, because it implies ways of living, thus also involves others, encounters, being told how others experience us and our doctrines and their consequences for our ways of living, he said. Taken together, these well-known insights from hermeneutical theory helped Thistleton to argue why it is necessary to look differently at Christian doctrine, focusing not only on what is being said in propositional form, but also at their self-involving commitments to the point where they may hurt us if we take them seriously, and to ask how others experience the practical implications of our convictions and commitments and doctrine. In this spirit, I therefore intended to continue with an account of how Reformed theology speaks the doctrine of election framed by South African politics. And then I was appointed to the Rimmer and Ruth, the free chair of Reformed theology <laughs> and public life. And it was agreed that the final lecture would also serve as inaugural lecture. The task of the chair is seemingly to consider how the rich resources of the reform tradition inform communities to engage with life in the public sphere. In my preparation, however, the phrase framed by politics became increasingly ambiguous. Could it not also mean that theology is being betrayed by politics, abused, forced into roles where it does not belong? After all, many people today seem convinced that the reformed theology is indeed easily framed by politics in this way. At least four such possible objections cannot be taken lightly. There are firstly many who argue that theology should concern itself with more than politics. 
Yet this objection may come from different directions. When the Amsterdam ethicist Harry Keutert published his book, Everything is Politics, but Politics is Not Everything, a theological perspective on faith and politics, it was an overnight success in apartheid circles. The argument supported their claims that politics should be kept out of church and church should stay out of politics. It was, of course, an opportunistic use of the argument to save their own interests. For long, the Bible and the Reformed tradition had been used to justify an ideology of separation, inequality, and oppression. Now that churches use the same Bible and the same Reformed resources challenging this ideology so that the Bible and church became so-called sites of struggle in South Africa, the argument that theology should not be concerned with politics was like a welcome gift. This was one use of the argument. During the time of transition, however, for completely different reasons, church leaders in resistance against apartheid also became convinced that they had spent too much attention on political issues during the struggle and neglected other crucial questions. During the struggle, political questions in the narrow sense of church-state relations and the so-called prophetic role of the church dominated all attention in struggle circles. With the, transformation, with the transformation of society, much of this changed overnight. For some, this new moment meant that the church could now return to its proper business and leave politics in the hands of the new politicians, many of them former black and prophetic and contextual theologians. Since politics were from their perspective now in good hands, many took it for granted that the church no longer had any political role. And that was another use of the argument. For still others, this new moment meant facing new challenges. Suddenly, ecumenical leaders were struggling to find constructive ways of engaging with other spheres of public life, from economy to education to law to civil society. Theologians now spoke positively about the common good and civil religion, and some published theologies of reconstruction. Russell Botman himself decided to do doctoral studies in direct response to this challenge. Bayes Nodea, an iconic figure in the struggle, challenged churches to think about their vision for a future after apartheid, about the quality of public life and about their calling in a future post-apartheid society. And Botman felt the need to respond. He was not interested in doctoral studies for academic purposes, but to find clarity on what he called the Bayes Nodi question. He was searching for a spirituality for this vocation to be involved in public life, which was much more than only politics. And this was another use of the argument. In the tradition, Pontius Pilate often stood as focus of the political calling of the church. His name in the creeds serves as a reminder that the suffering of Jesus was historical and political. State power is represented by Pilate, Barth famously said, and in him the failure and the perversion of politics was revealed. In Pilate, the state stands disgraced as gangster state and den of robbers. The passion of Christ unmasks and condemns this beast whose name is Paulus, Bart said. Similarly, in his book called Credo, the Yale historian Jaroslav Pelikan called confessing a political act. 
Christian confessors through the centuries, facing hostile authorities and suffering opposition and persecution, remembered Christ Jesus, who in his testimony before Pontius Pilate made the good confession. 1 Timothy 6, 13, Pelican said. However, Pilate also serves as a reminder of more than just political failure. His name reminds the church of the night of betrayal and of the complete failure of all human institutions of public life. The complete cultural collapse that night of truth and civilization and law and religion and public opinion. Even this reference to Pilate in the creeds speaks of more than politics, not only of church and state, but of church and public life in more complex ways. It serves as a reminder that the church's good confession about salvation and well-being and flourishing also involves these institutions that may also become perverted. This insight leads to even more reasons why theology should be concerned with more than politics. Again, Botman could serve as illustration. He often told the story how this insight dawned on him during a single life-changing moment here in Princeton in this library. He again told the story when he received the Kuiper Prize for his role in public life. Having worked on discipleship during the first period of his life, he said, during the time of struggle, he became convinced during the time of transformation that discipleship also involves the call to be responsible citizens in a secular pluralist society. Invited to the CTI for a sabbatical, he chose discipleship and citizenship as his theme. In this library, however, on a day that he often recalled, he realized that this theme was too restricted, too much limited to politics. As disciples, we not only live as citizens in our own societies, but as human beings in our common world. A focus on politics in our own nation state could blind us to the ways in which we are part of one global world. And since then, he focused on our shared responsibilities in the divine oikos, the household of God, including the global economy and the ecology of the web of all life on more than just politics. This conviction that theology is concerned with more than politics became important in so-called recent public theology. This is why Botman founded the Bayes Nodier Center for Public Theology in Stellenbosch. And this was the shift which John de Grouchy later described in his essay, From Political to Public Theologies. It remains contested what public theology is. Still, in their recent companion to public theology, Katie Day and Sebastian Kim begin with the story of an African-American faith worker who, during a public rally, in the aftermath of someone killed by a police officer, led a chant asking clergy to show how theology matters. Perhaps one could claim that public theology is based on this twofold assumption that public life matters for faith and theology, and that theology matters for public life because it is concerned with human flourishing. And perhaps this was what Warfield meant when he spoke about election. I would have explained this yesterday evening if there had been a lecture. <laughs> when he said 
the deepest roots, War Warfield, when Warfield said the deepest roots of the reformed concern for earthly life are found not in notions of creation and common grace, but in the reformed view of redemption and specifically the doctrine of election. Perhaps this is why he said that only uninstructed readers and unintelligent critics could fail to see this intimate connection between election and earthly life. This, however, leads to a second objection, since there are many who argue that theology should not be so concerned with earthly life and human flourishing at all. Contemporary theology, they claim, is more concerned with human flourishing than with its true object of interest and concern. Some, like Charles Taylor, argue that it is with the Reformation, and in particular Calvin and the Reformed tradition, that things went wrong. Taylor is concerned with what he calls excessive humanism. For him, this is typical of the spirit of our times. Somewhere along the last centuries, he says, the Christian faith was attacked from within Christendom and dethroned. In many ways, it was a humbling and a liberating development, he says, since it led to great advances in the practical penetration of the gospel in human life. And he is at pains to acknowledge many of these advances with obvious appreciation, like the affirmation of human rights. In many ways, our faith is now closer to, what, to where it should have been with a little help from our enemies, he says. At the same time, this attack from within had also, also had disastrous consequences, and he is also at pains to describe them. Exclusive humanism is based on a notion of human flourishing which recognizes no valid aim beyond human flourishing itself. It rejects any sense that there is something more or that life isn't the whole story. For him, this manifests as loss of transcendence, visible in the contemporary spirituality, which he describes as affirmation of ordinary life. This cultural revolution that took place dethroned transcendence so that our only concern now is to increase life, relieve suffering, and foster prosperity. This affirmation of ordinary life and human flourishing was originally inspired by the piety of the Reformation, he says. Their original critique of some forms of spiritual life was transformed into a secular critique of faith itself. I quote, this whole way of understanding things, Taylor says, penetrated far wider than card-carrying atheist-style secularists. And today it shapes the outlook of many who see themselves as believers. This way of understanding is a climate of thought it is a horizon of assumptions in which ordinary life and flourishing have become of supreme and only value. Now, in less sophisticated, much more popular ways, there are, of course, many who similarly fail to see the link between theology and public life. I see this lack of comprehension on many faces when I'm asked what I teach here in Princeton. <laughs> and I answer that the chair is called Reformed Theology and Public Life. <laughs> when Botman was rector of Stellenbosch, he started an initiative called the HOPE Project. The Council of University invited all faculties to propose projects to further any of the Millennium Goals. And they promised additional funding for those projects that were accepted. The theology faculty proposed to focus on human dignity, 
and poverty. In the Council's discussion, one senior and respected member said that he liked all the proposals except those from theology <laughs> because he simply could not understand what theology had to do with human dignity and poverty. And he probably spoke for many others. Still, anyone who knows the Reformed tradition will acknowledge the truth in Taylor's description. Whether it should be understood as loss of transcendence is another matter. But there is something in this tradition that deeply appreciates ordinary life and stresses the importance of human flourishing. And one could indeed argue that this is rooted in the doctrine of election. During this week, I try to show that such convictions are integral to a reformed doctrine of election, from Calvin to Barth, although I did not deal with either of them, but also from Barfunk and Warfield and Noordmans to Bayes Nodier and Willy Jonker and Alan Boussac and Russell Bortman. These convictions are integral to how this tradition reads scripture and to how this tradition worships. There is no tension between worshiping God and respecting the sacredness of human beings, between calling on God in liturgy and hearing the call from others not to be wronged and harmed. For Calvin, wherever God is known, there humanity flourishes. Ubi cognoscitur Deus etiam colitur humanitas. There is, however, also a third kind of objection against yet another way in which politics may frame theology. Some argue that theology's engagement with public life will inevitably be divisive and ideological. Theology will be used by politics for ulterior purposes, lose its integrity, be framed and instrumentalized given the nature of politics. Again, this argument may be practical, simply based on observation and common sense and experience. After all, the history of the church is deeply ambiguous, often shameful and terrifying. A history of being manipulated and complicit and instrumental in terrible atrocities without necessarily uh, being aware of what it was doing. This is true in South Africa, but also on a much larger scale. Ernst Trulch's famous account of Protestantism and progress already claimed that Reformed theology contributed to blessings in the modern world, but also helped to unleash powers which it could not control so that it became complicit in historical processes which we still do not fully understand, like imperial rule and colonization and economies of greed and exploitation. The argument can, however, also be one of principle based on a particular understanding of what politics is. The description by the controversial legal scholar Carl Schmitt of the concept of the political today plays a central role in political theology. According to Schmidt, the concept of the political is based on the distinction between friend and enemy, based on opposition to others, strangers, enemies, those of whom we fear that they represent a serious threat to our own interests. This concept of the political can be at work in all spheres of life, also in church and theology. Whenever we think and speak and act in terms of us and them, of ourselves and others, whenever we distinguish and name strangers and enemies and actually need them in order to define who we are. Recently, the African scholar Achille Mbembe published a passionate study on the politics of enmity. 
It has already been translated from French into Dutch uh, and German uh, in Politik von Feindschaft, uh, Politik der Feindschaft, but not yet in English. Mbembe, well known for work on post-colonial theory and blackness, here turns to contemporary global realities, describing what he calls the end of democracy and the growth of societies of enemies. He paints a somber, almost apocalyptic picture of the spirit of our time. It is a time of fear of others, where people despise all and everything which are not from them and like them. It is a time of exclusion and new forms of apartheid. It is a time of borders and boundaries and walls. It is a time of brutality and a time without compassion. A time of longing for societies without strangers. A time of movements motivated by hate. It is a time searching for enemies, desiring apartheid, longing for walls. It is a time challenging us with the question how we may recognize in the face of the enemy, the face of another human being just like us. In his analysis, Schmidt's notion of the concept of the political plays a key role. In fact, the world of Schmidt, Mbembe says, has become our world. In another recent study called The Political Samaritan, how power hijacked a parable, Nick Spencer describes how politics has framed theology in contemporary political discourse in Britain. He offers a sad description of what has gone wrong with the language of politics. And I quote, Scarred by rage, incomprehension, exaggeration, and aggression. An arm race of lurid claims and counterclaims. A powerful rhetoric of anti-rhetoric. A much thinned out common vocabulary. A much ignored set of rules for communication and an endemic lack of trust in one another, indeed a presupposition of untruth." End of quote. And then he illustrates how even the parable of the Samaritan, as representative of theological language, has been seized, hijacked by power, framed by politics across the spectrum of a bewildering range of purposes. This seems to be the story of theology in politics, framed to the point where it no longer speaks the language of election and welcome. This is what the Lutheran and Reformed communities together confess and lament in their Wittenberg witness from last year's commemoration of the Reformation. I spoke about this this afternoon. They confess and they lament, namely, that they allowed divisions which still obscure their unity and hamper their witness. They regret that through history, they too often formed divisive habits and structures, failing to discern the body of Christ. That injustice and conflict scar and scandalize their one body, and that they are implicated in colonialism and exploitation that mark their history. They are saddened, they say, by the ways they have allowed race and ethnicity, class and inequality, patriarchy and gender bias, and the arrogance of nation, language, and culture to become divisive and oppressive in their churches and in their world. This is the witness of churches who are aware how their theology has been framed by politics to the point where it often failed to speak the language of election. During apartheid, Archbishop Desmond Tutu said that the most vicious, indeed the most 
blasphemous aspect of apartheid for him was not the great suffering it caused, but the fact that it made children of God doubt that they were children of God. Apartheid theology was framed by politics to the point where theology could no longer speak the language of election and grace and welcome. There's an interesting story about the Jewish scholar Jakob Taubes and Karl Schmidt. Taubes was intrigued by Schmidt in spite of his reputation as the legal mind of the Nazi regime. So when Schmidt was already 91, Taubes wrote to him, Perhaps there will still come a moment, he wrote, at which we can speak about what is to me the most significant Jewish as well as Christian political theology. Romans 9 to 11. The word enemy also appears there, but, and this seems to me to be the most decisive of decisive points, connected with loved, loved by God. The next year, he finally visited Schmidt, who said, all right, Taubes, let's read Romans 9 to 11. Taubes wrote afterwards, it's one thing to read Romans 9 and to 11 with the theologians and philosophers, and another thing to read it with the greatest state law theorist of our time. Yet he explained Romans 9 to 11 until Schmidt said, 92 years old, Taubus, before you die, you must tell someone about this. Which is what Taubus did, literally during his last dying days, in the lectures posthumously published as The Political Theology of Paul. In making the distinction between friend and enemy fundamental, Schmidt only followed the way in which the church misunderstood Paul for centuries, said Taubus. Schmidt never understood that Paul spoke about enemy and love to together when speaking about election. There's also an interesting story about Abraham Kuyper. Speaking about election in his biblical meditations, Kuiper explains that our task is not to copy the doctrine of election of earlier generations, but to find our own answers amidst the spiritual winds blowing in our time. We should not revive old debates and defend positions from our past, but risk finding new ways so that today's children may once again in their own way feel the doctrine of election vibrating in themselves. And then he suddenly speaks of love for our enemies. There are many forms of love, he explains, but the highest form is love of our enemies. It is love which the human heart cannot even imagine. Love for those who hate us, who passionately turn against us. This is the love of God's election and free grace with which God loved us when we were God's enemies, says Kuiper. And this is the love to which the doctrine of election calls and moves and inspires us, the mystery of the Christian lifestyle and the mystery of Christian ethics. Could this be the way to think and speak about election by remembering that God loved us when we were enemies, and to think together about the implications of that for our ethics, given the spirit and challenges of our time. And finally, there are those who argue that theology is easily framed by politics, since politics is the so-called art of the possible. And accepting that description robs theology of the most important contribution it could have made. When uh, Otto von Bismarck coined this phrase, 
He meant that politics is the art of the attainable, the next best, uh, what could actually get done given the existing realities, famously called realpolitik. Accepting this view may frame theology to betray its hope in the power of the gospel of election and free grace. Since election operates according to grace, there is hope for even the most wretched, said Hermann Barfunk. Black theology in South Africa taught many of us to refuse to accept what seemed real and inevitable, that there is hope even for the most wretched. Reformed theologians like Alan Bussack and Russell Botman would therefore often speak about hope and about imagination. Bussack called his dissertation Farewell to Innocence, referring to the innocence of simply and silently accepting everything as it is, since this seems to be the way things always were and will always be. He quoted the Brazilian Presbyterian Ruben Alves, who wrote his dissertation here at Princeton Seminary, and shortly thereafter published his book, Tomorrow's Child, Imagination, Creativity, and the Rebirth of Culture. Alves argued for belief in the non-necessity of this imperfect order. And this appealed to Busak. For him, this made hope possible, anger, and courage, and imagination, the ability to say no and enough. Similarly, Botman also refused to become a prisoner of the past framed by politics. He also treasured the gifts of imagination and creativity, often seeing possibilities where many others were still unable to see a way into a new future. From early on, Botman was intrigued by, the, by Paul's words in 1 Corinthians 7, 29 to 31, that believers should live as if not, uh, as if present realities do not have the last word in shaping who we are. In the cross and the resurrection, Botman argued, believers see that the form of this world is passing away and that Christ is taking form in history and world transforming that which we see. In this spirit, he later dedicated his dissertation to their children and all the other children of South Africa, those who will know apartheid only by hearsay. This was remarkable, since he spoke about a future which few others could see at the time. He argued that the Bella Confession will one day be remembered as the gospel word that came too early for his generation, since they still found themselves in the grip of bygone political and church conflicts, saturated with conflicts from the past, framed by politics of yesterday. The dark glasses of their opposing views and stubborn aggression still distorted and darkened their vision. He said, we struggle with past and present conflicts, he wrote. We share in the disobedience of an entire generation. For this reason, Bella came too early for my generation. But as I come to know the upcoming generation better, I have no doubt that Bella will be joyfully heard by them, he said. Botman was concerned with the upcoming generation, tomorrow's children, those to whom the future belongs, as he often called them. Those not yet prisoners of history, not yet framed by politics. This is why he was concerned with public theology, because it mattered for the next generation. In one of his last papers, he wrote, our most crucial challenge is to create a world better than the one we created in the 20th century, a world of greater opportunities a greener world where wealth is shared, where we do not fight each other at every opportunity, 
a world where we learn to deal with conflicts and disputes in ways other than litigation and warfare. The difficulty is that we are still very much the products of that century. The question is whether we are able to imagine what the world of the next generation could be like and what theological guidance they will have. Hope brings us closest to the future generation. Hope is to focus on a better future and imagine that it is here already and to work as though it is just around the corner. It is not yet here, but once we have seen it, it becomes a generator of action. If politics is about the art of the possible, then theology is about more than politics. Theology matters for our life together in public in ways much deeper than politics. In his account of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, No Future Without Forgiveness, Archbishop Tutu explained how he became increasingly surprised at how relevant theology is for the whole of life. Theology matters, he says, he said, and offered only one particular illustration. The commission was often faced with perpetrators of the most horrendous atrocities and frequently so appalled at the depth of human depravity that they were tempted to call these perpetrators monsters because their deeds were monstrous. Theology, however, he said, prevented them from doing so. Theology reminded them to distinguish between deed and perpetrator and to hold these actors accountable because they were moral agents responsible for their actions. More importantly, he said, theology reminded them not to abandon hope for these perpetrators, but to see them as children of God with the capacity to repent and change. For him, theology constrained them in the commission never to give up on anyone because of who God is, contrary to the normal standards of the world. And then he says, we may never give up on anyone because God has a particularly soft spot for sinners. And we are constrained by this good news of a God with a bias contrary to the normal standards of the world. The God in Jesus Christ scandalized the respectable and associated with those on the fringes because God is preeminently the God of grace who does not give up on anyone. It almost sounds as if Tutu read Bafunk and Noordbans on the reformed doctrine of election. Doctrine matters for our life together in ways much deeper than politics. This is also true of the reformed doctrine of election. The question is not how accurate our propositions are, but how the way we speak matters to others. It can be welcoming or it can be horrifying. Of course, we do not even have to use the word election or be aware that we are speaking election language for this doctrine to function as the grammar of our thoughts and the rules of our common practices. We speak in response to real life questions with self-involving speech, giving dispositional accounts, implying and justifying certain ways of living. Our speech calls for formation and transformation. We cannot speak with the grammar of election if we are not willing to hurt ourselves, to be renewed to the glory of this God. We have to listen to strangers to tell us how they experience our speech as welcoming or frightening, as comforting or making them lose all hope. 
the way I understand it, Princeton Theological Seminary has a chair of Reformed Theology and Public Life because there are resources in the Reformed faith that matter for our public life together in wage much deeper than mere politics. I have been privileged to see this in the lives of many fellow South Africans, and I am deeply privileged to share these convictions here with the new generation of students, tomorrow's children, to whom the future belongs. Still, when asked what I teach, I struggle to say it simply, and I can understand the surprise and skepticism on many faces.